to receiving, receiving conviction. May we be open to receiving correction. May we be open to receiving the comfort that comes from your word and your word alone. For man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, Father, we come as people who are hungry and people who are desperate, people who are in great need of you. We acknowledge our need and our desperation. We ask for your Holy Spirit to fill us up. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would please turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, and hold up your Bibles and let me make sure that you have them. There we go. And if you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the back that you can uh, purchase after church there. Joshua 1, beginning with verse 1. After the death of, of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is a... Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You know, as Joshua was getting ready to lead the Israelites into the Promised Land, it's interesting that it starts off that uh, God reminds Joshua that Moses, my servant, is dead, as if Joshua might have forgotten that Moses had died there, but what God was reiterating there is that Moses wasn't the true leader. Moses led the people, but who was the one that was the true leader? Who was the one that made everything happen? It was God himself who made everything happen. And oftentimes we get distracted by our own ability or the abilities of other people around us. We get distracted and perhaps discouraged with the finite energy that we ourselves may possess for any given challenge ahead. We get discouraged by our finite understanding of the things that are going on around us. Many times we place our hope and confidence in the things of our flesh and our reasonings and our, our ideas on things. But what this passage reminds us is that our hope comes from God. Our strength comes from God. And that discouragement will come our way, but we are to counter discouragement, we are to counter fear, we are to counter it with our faith, and not just a wimpy faith, but a faith that is grounded in the solid truth of the Word of God. You see, I am very convinced that many Christians fail. They fail at this race of the faith, and we are whiny, we are fearful, we are discouraged, and we never get to the promised land that God has for each and every one of us because we are a people that are not grounded in the Word of God. We have enough faith to get into heaven. 
But we don't have enough faith to live with the power of heaven here on earth. You see, we are promised power from on high. We are promised that we are more than conquerors in any situation. But the reason that we fail isn't because of necessarily our church attendance. It isn't because of our activities. It is because we are biblically ignorant of God's revelation, of God's truth. Now, we may know a lot of things about the Bible. There are people that can tell me the, all the different books of the Bible, front words and backwards. But whether or not we have allowed the Word of God to dwell in us deeply, what the Bible tells us to dwell richly within us, whether we have allowed that truth to saturate our lives, makes all the difference. But see, there's a lot of people that don't even know enough of the Bible to even say anything about it, yet alone to say that we are actually bathing and eating and digesting the Word of God daily so that we allow that revelation of truth to transform us. The Bible tells us in Romans 12 too, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Whose job is it to renew your mind? It's our job. It is our individual responsibility to renew our mind because God has given us the resources to renew our mind. See, that's the whole thing. We always go, well, if I only knew how to. If you only knew how to, you know, I am not very good at reading instruction manuals. What would take somebody one hour will take me four hours, as I've shared with you in the past there. But you know what? At least I read the instruction manual. How many of us never actually open up the instruction manuals, the things that we purchase there? Okay? And sometimes that works out. And most of the time, it just ends up in sheer frustration, right? And a lot of times when you get the instruction manual, if you do read it, you don't understand it. It might be written in English, but you don't understand what they're actually saying. I don't understand all the different diagrams that they have putting things together. I can't visualize that. Oftentimes, that is the same thing, that the same excuse that people use about the Word of God. They go, I don't understand the Word of God. And because they don't understand the Word of God, they never open up the Word of God. The problem is we all have the ability to understand the Word of God but we all don't have the willingness to do what is necessary to get to that point of understanding it. You see, the Bible tells us that God will be found if we seek after him with all of our hearts. But can we honestly say that we seek after God with all of our hearts? Most of us, if you're, we're honest, we might seek after God 10% of our hearts, 5%, depends on the day. And we might start off with God as the number one priority, and gradually as the day goes on, God gets pushed aside as we allow the tyranny of the mundane and the tyranny of the urgent to overtake what is truly important in our lives. Matthew 6, 33, seek after the kingdom of God first, and everything else will be added unto you. An awesome promise. An awesome privilege to all of us. No wonder why we're discouraged. No wonder why we're anxious. No wonder why we're fearful. Because we are not doing what God told us to do first. If you don't do what God tells us to do first, everything else will be in vain. So how do we seek after God? We seek after God by going after the Word of God. The Word of God has been given to us. It is a precious gift for us. This is what Martin Luther said. The soul can do without everything except the Word of God, without which none at all of its wants are provided for. Without the Word of God within us as that foundation, we are building our lives upon sinking sand. Because the Word is truth. What it tells us in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. And the Word has been now made flesh in Jesus Christ. So we are given the Word in flesh within here. We are given the Word in flesh with the revelation of Christ. So we get an understanding, we get an example of what it means to be a follower of 
the word. But then we are also given the written word, which is for each and every one of us to take, hear, and apply in our lives. What does it say again within Joshua 1? If you take my word, you meditate it on, on it day and night, then you will be prosperous and successful. How many of us are looking at our situations in our lives and going, I don't feel very prosperous, very successful? Listen to our prayers, listen to our conversation and see if it lines up there with the claims that we have here. When Jesus was, began his ministry, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Interesting, the Holy Spirit led him to be tempted. Why did the Holy Spirit lead him to be tempted? Because it is only through the testing of our faith that we are able to be sure of what we know, we believe to be true. It's only when we go through the refiner's fire that we're able to burn away all the chaff and looseness of this world and able to get to the pure heart of the matter that we are all desperate for. When the devil tempts Jesus, Jesus responds, the first temptation is, Taking the bread, taking the stones and turning them into bread. Jesus is hungry. Forty days. I can't go eight hours most of the time. Forty days. He's hungry, and he has an opportunity to not only feed himself, but if he turns the stone into bread, he could solve world hunger and poverty instantly. Instantly be recognized as the man, the provider, and everybody would bow to him because, after all, there are two things that primarily motivate each and every one of us, food and fear. If I can feed you and eliminate the fear, you'll follow me wherever we go, right? Yeah, if I have a potluck dinner, we're all there. Nobody's there for shower ministry, just say. Okay, now, what does Jesus counter all this? Counter the need. Now, yes, there's great need in the world. People are hungry. Jesus was hungry. It's not wrong to want to satisfy that hunger, but Jesus counters the devil's temptation by saying this, that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, when we eat, we become hungry again, don't we? No matter how much we may stuff ourselves, and no matter how much we may say, I will never eat again, we're going to eat again, and again, and again, and again. But it is God's word which has the real ability to truly satisfy every need and every desire that we have on this work, in this world and in the world to come. Because it is God's revelation of himself in the written word. So when we talk about how we don't understand the Word of God, we need to understand this, that you cannot understand the Word of God apart from the revelation of God that is given to us by the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, and one of those primary roles of the Holy Spirit is to teach us what Jesus wants us to know. John 14, 26, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance all that I have said to you. Now here's one of the things that we need to understand. We need to ground ourselves in the red stuff in the Word of God. We need to ground ourselves in the Word of God because have you ever noticed that the voice of God can sound an awful lot like your own voice? And the voice of God sounds like your own voice when we have stifled out God's voice in our lives. See, we're all seeking revelation. We all want some sort of truth. At the end of the day, while we may say that we want independence, while we may say that we want to be all on our own, we do desire someone to tell us how to do something. We do want somebody. Why? Because that gives us somebody to blame. And it also is someone to take the responsibility, right? I mean, we love, I love when I get to give up the responsibility, when I don't have to be the person in charge and I can just follow behind. Nothing's more pleasing because you know what I get to do? I get to complain about the person in charge, do my little thing and say how they should have done it better, but I bear no responsibility to actually change anything. Amen? 
I, uh, yeah, 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 amen. Because we all like that stuff, right? And that's the same way in our life. But here's the thing. God wants to be in charge. And there's a part of us that wants God to be in charge. But we only want to take the truth of God that we like. That's many times the reason why we don't get into the Word of God. Because we don't really like what it has to say, right? How many of us stick with the pages that we like? Do we stick with the books that we like? The things that we understand? The passages? And most of the time, by the way, we take those passages out of context to apply it into our lives or to apply it into somebody else's life. I love that when we go, I have a revelation of God for you. My friends, God will generally, I don't ever want to put God into a categorical sense, but ge God generally does not give revelations about you to other people. God will give revelation to you about yourself. And vice versa, he's not going to sit there and go, well, now let me tell you about Cecil. Let me tell you about Tanya. Because how many of us understand, truly understand, that there's a lot of work that needs to go on inside here, inside ourselves, and that we don't really have the time, the resources, nor do we have the ability to change anybody else. So the Holy Spirit is going to tell us God's Word when we need it, and the Holy Spirit's also going to teach us God's Word. That is, there are days where I read the Word and I have no idea what it means. Anybody there with me? You have no idea what it means. And then you, a month later, you get a revelation. A month later, a year later, two years later, and sometimes you look at the same word and you get different revelations there. The Holy Spirit then is leading you into all truth. It isn't that the truth has changed, but it is that your ability to hear the truth has changed. Can you imagine teaching a kindergartner geometry? I can't imagine teaching myself right now geometry or anybody else teaching me geometry for that matter. I am so glad that I never have to sit through another math class again. Anybody else there with me? I am so glad that I, I cheated my way through math class. Middle school, high school, and nobody thought about the good Christian boy cheating himself way, you know, way out of those classes. But I just couldn't do it. See, you know, two fish, five loaves doesn't feed 5,000 in their math class. So... Don't look at me with that look of shame. I know things about you. Shall we start telling stories here? Okay. <laughs> Pianists are to be seen, not heard. Okay. John 16, 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. Here's the thing about the spirit of truth. He tells us what Jesus would tell us to do. He tells us to live like Jesus wants us to live. And so therefore, my friends, if you don't have a good understanding of the red stuff, that is the words of Jesus there, then what is the Holy Spirit going to use to teach you? See, I love this. When I teach a college class, the students come in and they go, do I need the textbook? Well, kind of. I'm going to test you on it. I'm hoping that you're reading it. Now, I'm pretty honest with them. I, when I give them the syllabus, uh, this past week they told me, we've never had a professor talk to us the way that you talk to us. Uh, because I gave them the syllabus and I said, here's uh, what the textbook readings, but I know that half of you haven't bought the textbook. The other half of you will not read the textbook. And the rest of you will complain about nothing. Okay, and you will learn nothing because you are not taking the responsibility to learn. Instead, you want me to like somehow download it into your brain and make it so easy for you there. Um, now, I might get, I might surmise that that's the same way that we approach church, isn't it? And approach our spiritual lives. You've been given the word of God. To whom much is given, much is expected. You've been given the Word of God, but how many of us dig into the Word of God? No, you'd rather me sit here and spoon-feed it to you, and I mimicked this last week, where I have to spoon-feed it to you, and then you dribble it out here, and I have to scoop it back up and put it back in there. Uh, but that's how it, how it goes. And that's why if students aren't successful, yeah, you know what, they're going to make it through the course. They're probably going to make it through because they know just enough how to get by. 
And how many of us are that way in the same thing with our Christian life? We know just enough, we do just enough, just enough to get by. But how many of us are tired of just getting by? No, not enough of us are just tired of just getting by. So the, the spirit is necessary to be the decoder ring to interpret the word of God. The other decoder ring that we are given is love. The love that God has for us and the love that we are to have for one another. Jesus tells us all the prophets, all the scriptures hinge on two commands. To love the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, and understanding and love your neighbor as you love yourself. If we don't have an understanding and a revelation and a progressive revelation of God's love, because you get an initial revelation of God's love, and then as you go throughout walking your daily life with God, you get to know more of God's love. God's love is the decoder ring to be able to understand the word. And our love for God and our love for other people is the decoder ring on how to apply the word of God in our lives. So it is the key to understanding, and it is the key to application. Now, when we have an understanding of the Word, that is when we have the power to live out the Christian life as it is intended, as it is described within the Word of God. This is what it says in Psalm 1, 2 through 3, about the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and what and, and, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Whatever he does, prospers. That means the word of God is going to make you a better employee. It's going to make you a better husband. It's going to make you a better wife. It's going to make you a better mother. It's going to make you a better father. Whatever you do, God promises that if we ground ourselves, it is our job to ground ourselves in God's word, he is going to make it so that it will prosper. Now here's the thing. We look at prosperity short term. God looks at prosperity long term. We look at our temporary ups and downs. God looks at what is going on in that long term situation and are we moving up to higher ground. Now, by the way, prosperity by God's word and prosperity by our earthly understanding are two very different things. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Jesus uses a very different standard of blessedness and a very different standard of prosperity as it relates to our lives. But the promise is this, that if we ground ourselves in the word of God in whatever season, See, this is the problem. We look for that ideal time, don't we? The ideal time when there isn't stress, and then I will serve God. The ideal time, well, you know what? When I finish school, then I will serve God. When I get to the certain age, then I will serve God. Then I will be stable. When, when all these certain circumstances come together and the cosmos line up at the right moment in time, and the heavens declare and the music sounds and the butterflies are around, at that moment in time, I will be ready. How many of you are ready? According to that definition. But yet there is a part, now while I was sarcastic, and kind of drew that out a little bit, isn't that how we kind of go in our minds? You know, it's okay for me to be in this season of kind of withered fruit. Some of us have trees of withered fruit that nobody wants to eat off of our tree. You don't even want to eat off of your own tree, do you? Nobody's coming up to you and go, hmm, look at the fruit there. They're looking, it's all shriveled up. Don't let your mind go too far with that. That's all I'm going to say with that. But here's the thing. A tree gives fruit not for itself, but for the world around it. Gives fruit, gives life, gives, gives sustenance to other people. So, ma so many of us are so needing somebody else to meet our needs, aren't we? I'm looking to you to complete me. What, what, what the, uh, that was uh, Tom Cruise in that movie, um, uh, Jerry Maguire, you complete me. Nobody has the ability to complete you, do they? They have the ability to compliment you, but they don't have the ability to complete you. 
And we're always looking for somebody to complete us. God has given us all the resources, all the things that are necessary to complete us, to make it so that we are prosperous and successful, and that we are firmly planted, streams of water, so no matter what's going on out here, it can be a dry season, but I got all that I need because I've gone down deeper. And all of us need to learn this encouragement of going down deeper in God's word because eventually we will be left unsatisfied with the things of this world and we will wonder what's going on. And not only will we be unsatisfied with the things of this world, I want to tell you that you will be unsatisfied with the things of God as well because we should not be seeking after God's hand. We should be seeking after God's heart. When we seek after God's heart, we get God's hand thrown in. How many of us are praying about the things of God and wondering we want more things of God? Maybe we want, we'll do more Bible study, we'll do all this stuff, but it isn't until we actually take what we hear and apply it that change will actually take, come forth in our lives. John 15, 7 Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be granted unto you. That is some good news there, isn't it? Amen. We go, wow. Now, but what's that mean? Abiding means I am remaining in. I'm cleaving to. I am steadfast. If I am remaining in God, what will be the result is that I will start thinking the things of God. You know, the more you get hanging out with somebody, don't you start picking up their mannerisms? You start acting like them, you start talking like them, you even start thinking like them. The more you hang out with God, the more you will start thinking like Him, talking like Him, and acting like Him. And it won't be something that you have to think about doing, it just happens. That's the way human nature is. We take one pattern and place it at the top of another pattern. We're actually not that individual as we might think that we are, right? All right, so the word, let me tell you what the Bible tells us about itself, the word of God. Please silence your phone at this time. The word of God is the re written revelation of God and instruction from God. So, um, shall I answer? Uh, so, uh, the written revelation of God the difference between revelation and inspiration is when you come to church here, my job, um, I would like to make you feel a little okay, but that's not really my job, okay? Really my job, I mean, if I can just slap you around, how many of us know that we need a big slap around? And those of you who don't know, well, go to a different church, okay? Because uh, I'm going to slap you around. The Bible actually does do a slap around because what is it? Revelation is God's truth applied to you. Before God's word is a window into the world, it is first a mirror into our souls. And so it is the written revelation of God and the instruction from God. And I should tell you that there are two types of instruction that you find within the word of God. Here are the two types. The first one is it gives us a revelation of who God is. The second is is a revelation of who we are, who we are today. And how we tend to manipulate the word of God, it doesn't change from back then to today. There were people that distorted the word of God then, and there were people that distorted the word of God now. There are passages in which God is revealing human pathology to us. He is revealing our own destructive patterns of behavior. And then there are passages where God is teaching us about his character and how we should emulate that character. You see, before I can get you to change, before anybody can get you to change, don't you have to be confronted with the truth to change? Don't you have to have an urgency to change? You will not change unless you need to change. How many of you know that we all need to change our diets? Most of us need to change our diets. One of the problems with American medical society is because the Americans are just too fat. They have given up pretty much saying the first question that they should ask when we go into the doctor's office, what are you eating? They know what we're eating. You can just look at us and know what we're eating. We're eating the little Debbies and the Twinkies and the Hobos. Right? And then we go, I don't know why I feel like this. I just feel so tired. I can't even click the mouse anymore to get on Facebook. 
I mean, just so pitiful, I can't update my Facebook status. The first question we always need to be confronted with is the truth about our own behaviors. And before we get that con confrontation of the truth of how destructive we are, what do we tend to do is we blame other people, right? We blame our mom, we blame our dad, we blame society, we blame the church, we blame that long-winded pastor, we blame all these people before we actually take responsibility of the truth. The second thing that the Word of God is, it, it is our sword. Now, when we talk about our sword, there are two ways that we talk about the sword. In Hebrews, it tells us that the Bible is sharper than any double-edged sword. Now, a double-edged sword is able to cut both ways. When you go in there, just slide it in, cut both ways. Um, and here's what the Bible goes on to tell us, that it, because it's sharper than any double-edged sword, it is able to divide within us our own attitudes, our motives, our behaviors. It gives us direct revelation about ourselves there. And you know what? How many of us have cut ourselves with a paper cut and go, ah, okay? It hurts. A little cut hurts. Imagine those big cuts. A double-edged sword, big cut in us. It does hurt, but sometimes we have to go through the hurt to get better at the end of the day. Amen. The second thing that it is, it is our sword to counter the, en the enemy's attacks, to counter the discouragement that we're facing, to counter the, the anger that we're facing, the hatred, to counter all these things. The Word of God is our sword. The next thing is, it is light in darkness. It gives us direction. It is our moral compass to make sure that we are heading in the right direction. I may not know at, in the middle of the night, I have a little night light now in my bathroom to make sure that I'm heading in the right direction to go to the bathroom. It's dark and I don't want to turn on the light. Now sometimes we just can't flip on the light switch in the, in the dark days of our lives. But the word of God is a light onto our path and it is guidance so that we always know are we heading in the right direction here. The Holy Spirit is not going to lead us outside of the boundaries of the Word of God. And the fourth thing, as mentioned before, it is our nourishment. If Jerry were here, he might be willing to shout out, you are what you eat. <laughs> and my friends, we are what we eat. Are we eating the things of this world? Are we eating the Twinkies and the Ho-Hos? Are we eating the Word of God? If I eat the Word of God, I will be satisfied. That's what the Bible tells us. We will be satisfied with the Word of God. And when we're satisfied, the most dangerous time to go grocery shopping is when you are hungry. Amen? Amen. You will overspend. It is proven you will overspend because you are hungry. And then we are savaging our cupboards at home. See, right? Any of you ever have a craving for sugar and you don't have it at the house? <laughs> And what do you do? You're, unless, you're, unless I'm an anomaly, I eat everything else, and I'm still unsatisfied, and then I get on the scale, and then I'm depressed, and then I finally go out and buy the Ben and Jerry's because I figure, why not? Okay. So, here's the thing about the Word and the follower of Jesus. You cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus and not follow His Word. Amen. Look what Jesus says. If you love me, Keep my commands. John 14, 15. He keeps it very simple. If you love me, do what I tell you to do. Well, Lord, I don't, I don't know what you told me to do. You got the book. You got the spirit. You do it. You do it. You practice. You try. And it's okay if you make mistakes. God has you covered. Amen? Amen. He'd rather make, have you make a mistake doing something than making the mistake of never doing anything. And most of us are look at all, so much of what we cannot do, and we make that to be an excuse of to do what to not do what we could do. We need to take the word and apply it and be okay and be willing to make mistakes. Ephesians four fourteen, Paul is very concerned with the church of Ephesus that they were infants, that they were tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. How many of us can look at our lives and feel like we are just tossed here and there 
And most of us, if we are honest with ourselves, are infants in the faith because we haven't been nourishing ourselves with the food that is necessary. We are on milk when we need meat. Amen? We should be at the point where not only we're eating meat, but we are serving meat to one another. We are serving meat to the world. But we just want the easy stuff. We want the mushy stuff because the other stuff is hard. It's hard. But the kingdom of God belongs to those who will take it by force. And we have been anointed for hard. We have been given the Holy Spirit, not for easy, but for difficult things, for challenging things. And that's also why we have been given the Word of God. And so it's about time that we start growing up, that we stop making excuses about things, and that we are also able then to listen to the things of this world and go, you know what, that is junk. That does not line up with the word of God, and I'm putting it out of my head. Instead, what do we do is we think about the things of this world, and we meditate on it, and we ruminate on it all the time. You take the junk, toss it out, you keep the good stuff. Amen. You need to keep a daily, a weekly, monthly, and a yearly inventory of what you are allowing in your life, and you need to apply it to the word of God and go, if this doesn't line up with the word of God, something has to go, and God's word is going to say, so I guess that has to go. Amen? Amen. And lastly, you need to study the word of God. It is not about reading the word of God. It is about studying the word of God. It's about digging into it. What is the meaning? How many of you can read something and have no idea what you just read? That happens to me all the time. We need to go beyond just reading, and we need to go to the deeper level there. That means actually, uh, you know, this is the other word that I told my students that they don't like to do, and this is the reason why our society is going downhill. Thinking. How many of you like to think? Not, not thinking about anything of substance. All right, yeah, there's a difference there. Because most of us spend our time thinking about Facebook status. Uh, what are, this is the famous thing of what we think about. What are we going to eat? I mean, the minute one meal's done, we're already thinking about, what shall I eat next? How many of us could think about some other things that we should be thinking about, okay? And our lives would be better if we stopped thinking about those things that we were thinking about. 2 Timothy 2.15 Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. It is a command for us to study the word of God so that we will receive his approval because when we stand before the Almighty, this won't work. The doll gave my Bible. I don't know. My grand, see, this is what, also what I told the students. Now, this is not very pastoral-like. And they go, aren't you a pastor? And I go, see me on Sunday. But they'll tell you I'm the same way there. But this is what I tell them. I don't care if your fourth grandmom died, because you would be surprised how many times a grandmother dies during the course of a class. When they don't have, when they don't have their homework died, done, my grandmom died. Do you want to see proof? Yes, I want to see a picture of the corpse. Show me a picture of the corpse. How do I know? All right. So, you know, I go, I don't care that your grandmom died. I don't care if a meteor hits you on the head. And I don't care if you got a bunion on your foot. The homework is due when the homework is due. And I'm not giving you 10% off to make you feel a little bit better and cause more work for myself. I go home and I go to bed whether you pass this course or you failed this course, and I don't really care at all about your grades. And they're just like, and they actually said, no one ever has spoken to us the way that you spoke. These are 18 and 19 year olds. And I go, well, it's about time somebody did. When we get up to the Almighty, we are not going to be able to go, I didn't know. I didn't want to. I had other priorities. Can you imagine standing before God and going, you know what? There was that television show. It was so good. I had to take your Bible and put it aside and watch that. I don't think we fail to under... I don't think we recognize the awesomeness of that moment when we have to stand before God and give an account of our life. And we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We will hear, depart from me, for I never knew you. 
And then there's a little range in between of, I gave you this life. What did you do with it? And you can't use the excuse any longer that you don't know. James 1.22 tells us it's not just about studying the Word of God, it's about putting it into action. Don't just be listeners of the Word, hearers of the Word, be doers of the Word. When we do the Word, we apply the Word, it becomes part of our nature there. My friends, do you want to be successful and prosperous wherever you go? Then meditate on God's Word day and night. Do not let it depart from your lips. Start changing the way you talk. Start changing the way you think. By putting the word of God in there, you'll be amazed at what will happen in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really.